there is so much enigma and mystery all around the world about the PE ratio. If you or and all the other investors can just read these two white papers, you can determine the fair or justified PE multiple for any listed stock in the entire world. What is the quickest way to compound our wealth? And trust me, when you do this every single day for many, many years, you can actually reflect, go back to these writings and then you realize just how far you have come along in your, in your life. In your opinion, do you think crypto is hope-based investing? Meet Garden Bay a seasoned fund manager and a well-respected value investor. With over 15 years of investing experience in the Indian equity market, Garden's stellar wealth partners India Fund achieved a remarkable 42% return in just 17 months since it went live. Gadam is also the author of the international bestseller on value investing, The Joys of Compounding, and his book has inspired investors all over the world. Thank you so much, Gadam, once again for uh, being here, giving me your precious time so that I can interview you and really find out about your investing wisdom. I clearly remember when I was reading this book, you talk about um, there was a period of time that you were able to, you were unable to get the investment job that you wanted and ended up, you actually had a lot of spare time to do a lot of reading on your own. And that period of time actually shaped you to become who you are today. So if you don't mind sharing, can you share with us a little bit about that experience back then and how has it helped you to become a better investor? As you uh, have read in the book and from my past interviews as well, there was a phase of one and a half years in the US when I was working at in a minimum wage job because I was trying to pursue my passion of getting a stock market job. And I did not want to go back to my previous uh, work of investment banking. And during those 18 months of work at the hotel, I read every single blog article published on blogs like safalneveshak.com, microcapclub.com, panduprofessor.com, and a few other uh, blogs. And the passionate pursuit of lifelong learning had finally begun. And it was only in hindsight that I realized just how powerful compounding knowledge as a concept is because bod the body language derives from self-confidence and self-confidence in turn derives from knowledge. So that is how I was able to ace all the three rounds of my uh, you know, portfolio manager job interview uh, one and a half years later and land a great job with Summit Global Investments as portfolio manager of their global equity strategy. So reading definitely helped and even otherwise for all investors, Reading is an essential skill because the good investors are those who can make use of the big ideas from the different disciplines and then combine those ideas to arrive at a more rational and objective decision, a more effective decisions. That's what good investing is all about. Our business is all about making better decisions. And to make better decisions, we have to educate ourselves on the basics from the different disciplines. You don't have to go very deep into multiple disciplines, but at least a working knowledge of the high level first principles from the different disciplines is essential. Uh, when, as you are saying, at that time, you read so many books, right? Which are, what are some of the books that really set the foundation for you and you constantly go back for the key principles, uh, even as today? I think for all uh, you know, Berkshire Atme shareholders and followers of Berkshire, I think uh, Warren Buffett's original Buffett partnership letters and all the Berkshire Hathaway annual letters are essential reading. And uh, in addition to this, you know, you should go to cnbc.com. There's an archive of all the past video recordings of the past Berkshire Hathaway meetings. You should go through them as well. In addition to this, these basic stuff, you should also read books like One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch, Mastering the Market Cycle and the Most Important Thing by Harvard Marx, Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits by Phil Fisher. These are classics in the investing field. So I think, you know, the, the Berkshire materials and these three books will get you on the right path to becoming a successful investor. And definitely you guys should also read The Joys of Compounding. I really love this book so much. I felt that there's a lot of wisdom, not just in the area of investing, but also in the area of life. And that's where it really calmed me a lot because when it comes to investing, the markets can be very, very volatile and emotional. But when I read this, it really gives me a very calming perspective and help to shape me to become a better investor over time as well. So thank you so much, Garden, for having this beautiful work here. Uh, my second question is related to your second book, which is The Making of a Value Investor. Inside the book, you wrote that you have learned to respect the market's wisdom over the years, and there is a reason everything trades at 
a level that it does and there are multiple yardsticks uh, of valuation. And we all know that actually valuation is something that is really tricky, can be very, very tough. So in fact, there are some businesses that are just constantly being traded at very high value. For example, Costco and all this. So for these kind of companies, how do you know when should we invest? If we just look at the P ratio, it seems high all the time. How do we judge that? So you very rightly said that uh, these high quality companies tend to trade at expensive valuations most of the time in the market. And that's why in, in the Joyza Compounding, there's a chapter title that the market is efficient most of the time, but not all of the time. So let me explain what that title of the chapter means. You get an opportunity to buy into such high quality businesses at a reasonable price in two situations. The first situation is one, when the high quality business experiences a short term headwind and ends up reporting a bad quarter or two. And because of the short term nature of most market participants, the stock sells off and you get to enter at a very reasonable price because the long term intrinsic value is not that much affected. But the short term price gets downgraded by force selling from many market participants. So that's the first situation in which you can buy into a high quality business at a reasonable price. The second uh, situation in which you can buy into high quality companies at reasonable prices is during a broad based market sell off or a broad based sectoral uh, sell off. So I'll give you three examples here. In 2018 calendar year, the Nasdaq fell 22% peak to trough in the last quarter and stocks of great businesses like Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon fell more than 30% in just three months. Two years later, in 2020, in the month of March, the Nasdaq fell more than 30% and all these stocks again fell, all these great businesses again fell by more than 30% in just a month. So in 2018, these businesses fell more than 30% in three months. In 2020, these businesses fell more than 30% in just one month. Mm -hmm. And then let's go two years later again, 2022. Nasdaq fell 35% in the year and all these stocks of great businesses fell more than 35% each in the entire year. So now we're in 2024. Again, that two-year clock has started. And this year, again, uh, you know, we, no, it's not a bad idea to keep some dry powder on the side to capitalize on a potential buying opportunity. Not There's nothing definitive or certain in markets. It's not 100% certain that, again, we'll get a sell-off this year. But history tells us that you, know, you keep getting opportunities every few years. 2018, 2020, 2022, you got... Out of five years, you've got opportunities in three of the five years. But the problem with most investors is that we just tend to be impatient. We want to be doing something all the time. But like I write in my second book, The Making of a Value Investor, not doing anything when there are no good opportunities available is also good capital allocation. Your job as an investor is that of a capital allocator. So if you don't get good prices, then just wait. It's better to be patient than poor. Absolutely love that. And and just like what you said, because sometimes investors can become very hasty because they keep on seeing prices going up and they felt like, oh my God, I better catch this. I have to go in right now. But just like what you said, the opportunities actually do come. We just need to be patient. Right? Sometimes just waiting for that one to two years, good opportunities can come in front of us. And that's where we need to also have the emotion discipline to act on it instead of being fearful at that time. All right. So my third question, relates to uh, some of the other companies, right? you know, like there are Costco that is uh, highly, highly uh, predictable. But at the same time, there are also companies like McDonald's, Starbucks, they are very predictable business. But when I check on their uh, return on equity, the number can't be found because the equity is actually negative. And if I'm not wrong, the, com the management actually uh, borrow a lot of money to buy back the shares. So do you think that Firstly, is this something that it's considered safe to invest in businesses like this that buy up, buy back a lot of shares? Or do you think that it's okay because the company itself has a lot of cash flow, so it's able to support uh, this case? So what's your take on that? So again, Buffett has already taught us the fundamental principle of, of stock buybacks. If these companies are buying back their stock below intrinsic value or below fair value, then that will create value for existing shareholders. But... If these companies, which you mentioned, are buying back their stock at very steep lofty valuations, way above intrinsic value, that will dilute the existing uh, shareholders. So it's all a function of whether the company is paying a reasonable price to buy back the stock. You mentioned that companies are borrowing money to buy back their stock. So let's uh, let's assume that it's, we are in 2020, when interest rates were slashed to 0%. In that kind of a scenario, when stock prices have crashed and interest rates are at 0 to 1%, it is a very smart capital allocation strategy to borrow at dirt cheap interest rates 
and buy back the stock, which is trading at a depressed valuation, way below intrinsic value. That is the hallmark of a great management. That's why we should also look at the interest rate situation, whether uh, is this the, still the smart move to do so, uh, or it could be a little bit risky to do so during this high interest rate environment. Thanks so much for your enlightenment. Um, now, my next question, it's a little bit uh, number centric. So I know some investors like to always like to compare metrics like RIC, which is return on invested capital to a weighted average cost of capital. So based on this ability, they always want to invest in companies that has higher RIC than WACC, right? So is there any point where it actually correlates with fair value of like a P ratio of a company? And how do you determine when is it fair? Like WACC, how do you calculate and all this? I'm very glad you asked me this question because there is so much enigma and mystery all around the world about the PE ratio. You know, many many you know uh, newcomer investors, new investors in the market, they look at a, they look at a stock trading at 10 PE, they consider it cheap, and they look at a stock of a good quality business trading at 50 PE, and they call it expensive. But mm -hmm. investing is never you know black or white. It's always shades of gray. Investing is a probabilistic activity, but just to specifically answer your question, how do we use this information of ROIC and back to determine the fair P multiple of the business? Every investor just needs to just needs to read two white papers, which I'm going to share with right, right now with all of you. The first white paper is titled, What Does the Price to Earning Multiple Mean by Michael Morbison? And the second white paper is called The P Ratio, a user's manual by Epoch Investment Partners. And Clo, if you or and all the other investors can just read these two white papers, you can determine the fair or justified P multiple for any listed stock in the entire world based on an interplay between the ROIC and the earnings growth. So you know, this, these two white papers will completely clarify you know, everyone's thinking, you know, what, what is the fair or justified P multiple for any listed stock in the world? If you can, once you've understood the justified P multiple for a business, if you buy the stock below the justified P multiple, then over time, you will you, your returns will correlate with the earnings growth, plus you'll benefit from valuation re-rating. And if you buy a stock above the justified P multiple based on these two white papers, then over time, you will benefit from the earnings growth, you'll get the returns from there, but you are at risk of, uh, of uh, valuation de-rating. So this is a crystal clear concept of how to approach valuation because there's so much noise out there, what is the right valuation, and everyone is just giving out subjective opinions and their personal opinions on Twitter, LinkedIn, everywhere else. But there's a, but you know, investing is part science and part art. So nuanced judgment is required. Mm -hmm. What I've shared with you right now is the science part of investing. And once you have understood the justified P multiple of the, of the company, then the art part of investing comes into the picture where you put your, uh, you know, your hat of a business analyst, not a securities analyst, like Charlie Munger says, you know, we, should, we should be business analyst. You try to understand or gauge the longevity of the business, the competitive advantage of the business, because the competitive advantage is what will help the company maintain higher ROIC way above the cost of capital. And that is what creates economic value for shareholders. Wow. Okay. I, I remember when I was reading your book, you talk about these two papers. I have not found the time to read it, but since today you stress the importance of it, I should totally go and find time to read these white papers. So uh, if I, if you don't mind me just delving a little bit into WACC, right? Because the formula of it is really complex. Do you do all those calculations by yourself or do you actually just, you know, simply take maybe 5%, 10% above the market premium? So again, let's uh, you know draw from the wisdom of uh, you know the two of the great investors. Let's talk about Charlie Munger. What he has told, explained to us, and taught us. Charlie Munger says that all wise individuals make decisions in terms of opportunity costs, mm. and investors are always measuring new ideas against their available alternatives. So taking a cue from Munger's wisdom, we can reasonably say that the S and P five hundreds long-term annual return of nine and a half percent over the last hundred years can be taken as a reasonably good proxy mm. for an investor's long-term opportunity cost in the market. Mm. And for investors in markets outside the US, they can look at the long-term annual returns of their respective stock markets to arrive at their respective opportunity cost, long-term opportunity cost. And this will be a good proxy for the cost of capital in that, in that particular country. Once you've got this as a starting point, then it can be revised up or down 
depending on the individual business's characteristics. So this is the most practical way to approach uh, back or weighted average cost of capital or cost of capital. Just think in terms of long-term opportunity cost. Mm. You can get that easily from looking at the long-term returns of your country's stock market. In your book, uh, you also shared that in your humble opinion, the days that one can just take five to 10 years uh, to view on a stock are gone, right? And you believe that two to three years is the maximum feasible period in today's fast-changing, highly disruptive environment. Businesses can take some time to truly reflect whether does it turn bad or not. For yourself, then how do we truly identify the fine line between whether is this a temporary impact on the business or it's a permanent loss of its economy? So the last part of your question is the most important. How do we assess whether the economic mode of the business is becoming impaired or harmed? Yeah. And you look, at, you look at two things here. You look Two metrics will give it away. So look at the working capital cycle of the company. So if the business is unable to negotiate good terms of trade with its customers and suppliers, it will reflect in the working capital cycle worsening. So your debtor days will go up, your inventory days will go up. And uh, that is a sign of the economic mode weakening because generally these strongly moted businesses tend to operate on negative working capital or very tight working capital cycles. They basically sell goods on cash and they buy goods on credit. So that's the sign of a economic mode which is in danger looking at the working capital cycle. The second way you can understand whether an economic mode is getting impaired is by looking at the gross margin trajectory of the business because businesses with strong economic modes tend to have pricing power and a strong pricing power is best reflected in a very high gross margin, 70, 75, 80% gross margins. At mm -hmm. the end of the day, you spend all your marketing and other R&D dollars from your gross margins, right? So the higher the gross margin, the more leeway for the business to invest in sales and marketing. So the gross margin is sharply worsening. That's also a sign that the economic mode may be worsening. But apart from these two quantitative criteria, there's some qualitative criteria as well, which will help you exit the stock on time. So if there's a bad corporate governance practice by the management, if they treat minority shareholders badly, that's a straight you know, way to get out. If, and if it's an expensive stock, which suddenly reports a fall in profits year on year, then what will happen is because this, the P ratio is already high and if the, 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 if the denominator, the earnings per share, if that starts falling, then the P ratio will start going further up. So an expensive stock becomes absurdly expensive when yeah. the earnings starts de decelerating and falling. So this is another you know, way to quickly you know, get out and ahead of uh, the upcoming derating of the company. So for yourself, like usually when you buy into the stock, you will usually be holding on for like two years. And within these two years, we'll be constantly monitoring and like studying the economic mode of the company. And if after two years, if you felt that the company has indeed deteriorated or whatnot, that will be some of the Q criteria that you just mentioned, right? But I generally, sometimes... I generally, look, yeah, I generally track these metrics on a one-year basis. I give, I generally give management at least one year to prove to me that they can execute. I think four mm. quarters are more than enough time to give to a management to at least start executing. If they're unable to execute even once in four quarters, mm. then that's, you, know, that's, you just have to accept that the management is not being able to execute. You sell that comp that sell that stock get the cash and then deploy into the next opportunity but i think four quarters is more than enough leeway to give to a management i also remember in the book you mentioned that um you don't like your portfolio to be too concentrated because it doesn't give you a lot of peace of mind so for yourself what is the portfolio percentage allocation that you are willing to invest in any single company so for Stellavel Partners India Fund, uh, I generally initiate new positions with a weight of between 3 to 5%. And uh, I do not allocate more than 10% to a single stock at cost in the beginning. And I also have internal risk management rules in place. So I do not let a single stock become more than 15% of the overall fund by value. And I limit individual industry exposure, ex exposure levels to 30% of the overall portfolio by value. Uh, I hold between 20 and 25 stocks uh, in the fund at all points of time. And, the, and that's because that is the optimal number of holdings to maximize the risk and return trade-off. So as per, an, as per an empirical study published in the international bestseller, a random walk on Wall Street by Burton Mulkill, it was shown that as the number of stocks in a portfolio reaches 25 names, the incremental volatility, volatility reducing benefits of diversification reach near zero. So this is the sweet spot for an active investor seeking to outperform the market. 
At 20 to 25 stocks, you have captured almost all of the benefits of diversification, yet the number of stocks you need to know thoroughly is still manageable. So why do you think, for example, I know Berkshire's, uh, you know, like their size is really big. Is that why they can afford to have like, let's say 50 companies at the same time? Yeah, I think uh, Berkshire Hathaway, I think if you look at their uh, uh, portfolio today, almost 35, 40% of it is in single stock Apple. So, you know, mm. they're pretty concentrated. So if you just look at the top five positions, of Berkshire, they are actually very pretty highly concentrated. And you know, Buffett and Munger have talked about this important point that if you just take out the 12 best investing decisions of Berkshire over the last 50 years, and then their track record would be very mediocre. So I think the key to being becoming a good investor is to let your winners run and to make your good investments count. So many of us, we just tend to, you know, at the moment the moment a stock doubles, we just sell it and book profits. But in order to have a multi-bagger or a 10-bagger in your portfolio, you need to hold on to a 10-bagger in your portfolio. So holding on is key. And since we are talking about your fund, I also understand that your fund actually adopt this uh, Warren Buffett's way of approach, right? Can you just elaborate a little bit more about the fee structure and why do you design it this way? So uh, the Stellavel Partners India Fund's fee structure is actually an improvement on the original Buffett Partnership fee structure, which was 0625. In my case, I have a 0620 fee structure, zero management fee, 6% annual cumulative compounding hurdle rate, which means that in, suppose in year one, the investor makes zero. Then at the end of year two, until the investor has made 6% into 1.06, 12.36% till that time I don't earn a single penny from him. And finally, there's a 20% performance fee on returns over the 6% hurdle rate. So if the fund delivers 16% dollar return for the year, then the performance fee becomes 16% minus 6% hurdle rate, 10%, 20% of that is 2%. So 2% is the performance fee and the investor's account gets appreciated by 16 minus 2, 14% for the year. And the logic behind, you know, the keeping this kind of a fee structure, which I'm very happy about because this is my biggest USP, biggest selling point in my India fund because there is no other India fund in entire America which mm -hmm. offers you this kind of fee, this kind of a client-centric fee structure. Other managers, managers are either charging a 2% management fee or some management fee and a 25% profit sharing over the hurdle rate. But when I ran the numbers over 20 years, uh, between performance fee at 25% and performance fees at 20%, this difference of 5% performance fee when compounded over 20 long years makes a very large difference to the client's eventual net worth because you know in, on an annual basis it seems very small but when you compound it over 20 years it makes a very big difference so I just thought for the benefit of my clients let me reduce the performance fee to 20 percent that's in a way that you are thinking about for the future clients uh, portfolio growth and you want to make sure you take good care of them and that's why you structure your fees in this way right and if you don't mind sharing right right now for your fund um what's the aum and what's the return so far so the fund went live on 3rd october 2022 and in the first 17 months the fund has delivered 42 percent return in usd after performance fees and uh, the current assets under management is $11.2 million as of wow. today. Wow, that's amazing. Since your fund, it's based in, like you only invest in India, right? And I know that for the India market, it's pretty tricky. You know, the valuation, like what you said, right? It's It seems to be always high, right? So in a way, um, what? how do you spot great companies in India? And like, how do how should investors approach that the India market valuation is constantly high, um, then what can we do about it? So how do you identify good, good companies or high quality companies? It's the same method everywhere, be it the US, be it India, the objective is the same. Let me define what a good quality business means. A good quality business is one, which has a return on capital, way above its cost of capital. That's the first point. The second point, the business has to have some form of a competitive advantage or an economic moat in order to maintain that spread between the return on capital and the cost of capital for a long period of time. And point number three, the business has to have sufficient reinvestment opportunities within the business at high returns on capital. That kind of a business becomes a compounding machine. That's the definition of a quality company. Mm -hmm. Now, adding, you know, this uh, the reason why high valuations persist in the Indian stock market, India's stock market is very unique. So, no, the Indian market basically has got the highest level of insider ownership among all the stock markets in the world. As a result of which, there is a supply-demand imbalance mm -hmm. in its local stock market. The supply of quality equities in the Indian market is very limited. 
and that is why the, the handful of good quality companies in india tend to enjoy a very high scarcity premium they are very scarce and rare so you know, that's why they tend to trade at very expensive valuations plus corporate governance is not a really a major issue with most of the listed companies in the us but in case of india most of the listed companies either suffer from bad accounting quality or poor corporate governance so again the same problem comes back of sub demand supply the handful of good quality companies with good corporate governance they are the ones in which institutional investors like mutual funds and foreign investors can invest and they keep chasing the same set of 100 100 to 150 stocks again time and again and therefore simple economics 101 if supply is limited and demand is high then what will happen to the price the price will go up over time Mm. So for your fund, do you mainly invest in like mid cap or like small cap or like large cap in India? It's a multi cap strategy. So right now we have sixty percent in small caps, twenty percent in mid caps, and twenty percent in large caps right now. But we are sector cap, sector and market cap agnostic. So in a future bear market, so in a bear market, what happens is the market becomes very narrow and earnings growth. basically evaporate and vanishes across uh, different industries and across companies so only a handful of stocks in the market display earnings growth especially among large caps so in the future bear market you may see the tilt shifting the 60% small cap may shift to 60% large cap we invest wherever we find earnings growth at reasonable or fair valuations i mean and like i've written in my second book also i'm even okay with paying a full price the full justified p multiple or full you know or even an expensive p multiple entry uh, upon entry because even if i don't earn returns in the first year the returns from year 2 yeah. to year 5 will compensate for the lack of returns in year 1 this is a very big investing wisdom which you actually learn only over time that this is a concept called time arbitrage so basically mm-hmm. just by extending your time horizon you are able to enter into a very high quality long term compounding machine at a you know at what in hindsight will seem like a reasonable price like like what you said right because uh we need time for the company to perform to run and and let the winners continue to run so just now you did mention that at a period of time you will maximum keep one company to 15% so that means in a way you have to trim a little bit of the winners if it runs too much so what's your take on that trimming is slightly is fine but given that you are having 25 positions in your fund so and if you are initiating a new position at 5% so you know for a, for a stock to become 15% of the aggregate fund by value yeah. you know because you know new inflows keep coming in every month and you know weights of other stocks will also keep rising over time because of appreciation so for a stock to reach 15% weight over time means that it has to become a 10 bagger or more if you do mm. think uh, you think through it it is not as simple as you know 5% becoming 15% is a three bagger no in a in a, mm-hmm. in a fund structure because new money is coming in every month and other stocks are also going up at the same time for a stock to actually go up to 15% by itself in the fund at the fund level means that it will have to become a big 10 bagger or big multi bagger so that's a very good problem to have i hope your words come true <laughs> <laughs> I would love to have this problem one day. <laughs> That would be nice. <laughs> so now my next question is: I can see that you really study so deeply into all those great businesses, and that's why your fund is performing so well. As an investor, like what is your daily habit that make you to become good at what you are doing? I think just keeping away from the noise as much as possible is one of the best habits I've adopted. So, and, and so in the Indian markets, open at. late night my local time and i i am based in eastern time zone in atlanta georgia so it's new york time and the indian markets open at 11:45 pm every night so my job is very simple just put in the limit order the put in the limit buy and sell orders to my broker and i can go to sleep while the indian markets is open and because i'm asleep while the indian markets are open it helps me avoid all that daily chatter and daily news flow and daily noise which takes place while the markets are open because all these market commentators and social media handles are just screaming from the rooftops about this thing this is this has happened today this has happened today but businesses do not get built, built in a single day businesses are built built over generations over decades right the bulk of the intrinsic value of any company lies you know 5 10 years out in the into the you know way out into the, into the future right so the daily news flow doesn't doesn't really make a big difference to the long term intrinsic value of a company so it's this habit of staying away from the noise as much as possible has greatly helped me become a more rational investor if i can call it that Is that like a decision by choice that you purposely choose to move out of India so that you can stay away from the noises and and live in the in the states? No, I had moved from India to US in two thousand fifteen. That time I was uh, 
you know, in search of a good stock market job because in India I was not getting a good stock market job. Yeah. So, but so the decision to move to the US was not based because that, at, when I was even when I started my job uh, as a portfolio yeah. manager at Summit Global, where I worked for four and a half years, even during that time I had never thought that I one day I'll actually quit my job and venture out on my own and become my own boss and run my own business. But um, you know, like Steve Jobs has said, like you cannot connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect the dots looking backward. So in the end, everything came together to you know result in a very fulfilling and happy life because I know for a fact that when passion meets profession. Mm. wealth and success follows it has to, it's, it's bound to happen you know you just have to have faith that you know the dot will eventually connect and the, you know, the universe works in such a way to help you achieve your goals when you are a you know nice and helpful person yesterday i tweeted on twitter also that being a nice and helpful person is a superpower just being a you know, i noticed your post on linkedin also just i think today or yesterday that you talked about vitali's you know talk on benevolence and being a kind yes. person i think just being a helpful person being being helpful and genuine with people that itself will get you so far ahead in life thanks for also reading my post and sharing it because i'm learning so much from you from all those great investors and i think as i pen down my thoughts it helped to crystallize uh my 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 own thinking as well is that why writing to you is so important that it helps you to pen down your thoughts and crystallize your your thoughts I write every single day, Chloe, and it's just not on investing. Like you saw in the making of a value investor, apart from my investment journal, I write on many other things as well. So there's there's a five part section uh, in my journal, a separate journal which I also maintain. So the first part one is titled "I'm grateful for," and then there are three points within that. Second uh, heading is "What would make today great?" There are three more points uh, within that. Third part number three is daily affirmation. So you no, know, there's something called positive affirmations. If you a firm or promise something to yourself which if you say something to yourself that i'm going to do this i'm going mm-hmm. to achieve this i'm i'm like this kind of a person i'm i'm, I'm good at this if you keep doing this self affirmations it has a very powerful impact on your mindset so that's where that section of compounding positive thoughts and jobs of compounding comes from so that was part 3 then uh, part 4 is highlights of the day there are uh, three points within that and then finally we I, i end with what did i learn today there are three more points within that so five parts in addition to my daily investment journal which i maintain there is a separate journal in which there are these five parts which i also maintain every day and trust me when you do this every single day for many many years over thousands of days you can actually reflect go back to these writings and then you realize just how far you have come along in your life in your life wow what a beautiful insight and do you do that at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day part 1 to 3 at the beginning of the day uh, after breakfast and uh, the last parts so four and five are done just before sleeping beautiful because the one two three is to set the intention and set the direction for the day and then at the end it's what you learned and uh the the reflections of what happened today oh wow, that's beautiful yes. i could totally start doing that thank you so much my next question is uh has to do with other investment vehicle you know like because we know that resilience is super powerful um but at the same time there are also other investment vehicle that went up so quickly for example bitcoins and all this in your book you wrote that i would rather buy on some development and materialization than do hope based investing so in your opinion do you think crypto is hope based investing you have some of the world's smartest minds backing a particular technology it's not a wise uh, decision to go against it so i do, personally i do not invest in crypto any cryptos or bitcoin or ethereum but i think for traders with a very good risk management discipline it's a great place because it's a very volatile asset class and that is where trade good traders can make a lot of money and also you have to understand that ultimately you know liquidity liquidity drives prices so recently bitcoin etfs were launched in the us and that yep. has driven large amount of inflows into bitcoin etfs after which you have seen a sharp surge in bitcoin prices Mm. similar thing happened many years ago when gold etfs were launched for the first time and then gold appreciated significantly i think uh, in terms of price appreciation there's a good potential but i personally do not understand it because it does not generate cash flow and i cannot value it so that's why i do not invest in it i have 100% of my personal equity allocation only within my india fund so i'll give you a quick snapshot here of just how greatly i've simplified my life flow i have one single investment into inside my india fund i have one single house in the us and i have one second check one single checking checking account so one bank account one investment one house that's it my entire net worth right there so i have the more you simplify your life the more happier you will you will be trust me on this 
that's true because simplicity make also will give you that peace of mind right that you don't need to spend so much energy think about oh so many different things every single day because it's it's just there right then you just focus on making it even better is that correct right so basically for me no precious metals no commodities no real estate no investment no bit no, no bitcoin no alternative investments just kept just kept life very simple because you know like when you know in your first half of your life you're basically adding stuff all the time and in the second half of your life once you have become wise and gained wisdom and experience you are busy subtracting things from your life that's basically mm-hmm. how most people behave uh, and that's what mango say as well wow and in your opinion, right, then what is the quickest way to compound our wealth, especially for new beginner investors? What's your advice for them? By investing in yourself. That's the fastest and most effective way to compound your wealth. The best investment you can make is an investment in yourself. The more you learn, the more you earn. So you have to be a learning machine. So that's, that's, that is what you know is essential to becoming successful in this field. And avoid get rich quick schemes because they mm-hmm. eventually lead to the eventually lead to ruin in the doghouse. So avoid, you know, if anyone is providing you a guaranteed high return in the stock market or any other market, just run for the hills. You know, just stay away from such uh, schemes because ultimately they turn out to be either fraudulent or some kind of a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, because nowadays I just see more and more scammers popping up and more and more people are falling for scams and because they all want to get rich quick. Uh, however, if we go back to the true principle of investing, it's never about getting quick rich. It's about really building that resilience and building that capability to grow our wealth over a long period of time. Uh, I'm just going to wrap up this interview very soon. I just The last question I have for you is um, if people want to go and find more about your work, about your fund, where can they get more information and learn from you? So readers can purchase a copy of The Joys of Compounding and The Making of a Value Investor on, on Amazon. And for U.S. citizens and U.S. green card holders who are interested to invest in the Stellar Wealth Partners India Fund, they can visit StellarWealthIndia.com. So what if for people who are like not U.S. citizens, like they have no way to invest in your fund at all for now? So, so for NRIs, that is non-resident Indians and domestic Indian citizens, we have also launched a portfolio management scheme, a PMS in India, in collaboration with Complete Circle Wealth Solutions to cater to the Indians living outside India as well as the citizens living inside India. So that's a separate investment vehicle in that the fund manager is different, but the philosophy is exactly the same, which I follow at Stellar Wealth Partners India Fund. Would you be going to Berkshire this year? Yes, I will be going to Berkshire Hathaway in in May. Oh, wow. Then I will get to see you. I hope to see you in person and I would love you to sign a copy (laughs) of the book over here. That would be great. Sure. Thank you so much, Gautam. And so nice to have you here. Thanks once again for all your insights. I learned a lot from you and I will continue to learn more. Uh, keep keep reading your book. Uh, in fact, I'm like halfway through your uh, The Making of Value Investor. And I thought it was a good way that every day I just read a few dates because you, you actually put it out in different dates and kind of feel like, oh, okay, today I should read a few dates just to make myself more grounded as an investor. And for those who are wondering, the value, uh, the making of value investor, even though uh, Gautam writes a lot in based on the India stocks, but the principles actually apply to everywhere. As I was reading, I just felt like, oh, wow. It kind of tri- take me back to just two, 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 three years ago when the market goes through the boom and bust. And a lot of things made me reflect on my own portfolio as well, even though it's US-based. So thank you once again for all your wisdom and can't wait to see you in person when we meet in uh, Berkshire AGM. And with a small message here, Chloe, sure, that, you know, sure. investing is a field of competitive learning. So it's all about competitive learning. And, and in order to outperform the rest, you have to outlearn the rest. So, you know, it's all about having this high level of intellectual curiosity and this passion mm-hmm. for reading and learning. And if you don't want to read books, it's okay. Just open an educational YouTube video or open a good podcast interview. Like yesterday, just out of sheer curiosity, there is a podcast channel called Millennium Investing in the US. I was going through many of their past podcasts over the last one week. And just yesterday, I came across one podcast, which was simply exceptional. And I just posted it on LinkedIn and Twitter. So the idea is to just, whenever you come across some great content, which you really like, just share it with your friends and uh, people in your network i think you know because the more you share about what you're really enjoying it will help you attract like-minded people into your circle that's i think that's the biggest benefit of social media that you can cultivate your circle and then like-minded people come into your fold and i think that leads to a very 
fulfilling life because at the end of the day you know most of us value investors we are very different from the rest of the world as you must acknowledge that we are very different in terms of our lifestyle our thinking our approach our value systems are very different our habits are very different so you know it's a very niche small community but if you can if you want to attract like minded people in, into your life it will really lead to a lot of happiness and i absolutely agree like i i really realize the power of social media because of that i managed to connect with you right because of that i managed to connect with william green and all these great authors and investors i've never thought about wow i'm able to ever have that kind of uh, intersection in my life so uh just like what gadam said like just there's so many resources available if you don't enjoy reading for now well which in the past i also didn't believe that i enjoy reading but i think over time i developed this habit and grow to see myself as a reader so uh just start with something that you are most comfortable with watch a youtube video listen to podcasts and keep on going in this journey and over time you will continue to become better and better thank you so much garland for your wonderful advice and uh thank you everybody for be for being here as well and we can't wait to see you guys in the next sharing thank you so much for inspiring us thank you have a good day thank, thank you. you all of you thank you so much thank you.